But if you actually look at the epidemiology, there are a few fundamental um, uh, observations. One is the relative absence of cancer in isolated populations eating traditional diets. And um, this goes back to the 1870s, 1880s, and this, uh, you know, uh, missionary physicians, colonial physicians working all around the world who would have these hospitals, and they would say, look, uh, you know, they'd write letters to the British Medical Journal, the Lancet, or the East African Medical Journal, saying, you know, I have a hospital in Botswana land, and I administer to a population of, you know, 9,000 African natives and 300 Caucasians who are loggers and missionaries and traders, and in the past 16 years I've seen 22 cancers in my white population and only two in my black population. Those two were among domestics who worked for the whites and lived life for the whites. And this was a fairly consistent observation all around the world. And in the 1910s, it was studied by uh, statisticians, and several books were written about it. And it was pretty, the conclusion was, the doctors making these observations were very, um, I mean, they were good doctors. Albert Schweitzer won the Nobel Peace Prize with one of them. They were trained in Europe. They went off to work, you know, Europe, uh, you know, American medical schools, they went off to work in the far corners of the globe. They were smart enough to know that they, whether they were seeing natives who were old enough to get cancer, or whether all their natives were dead by 40. Um, there were some surveys done with, for instance, Native Americans by, uh, there was a fellow at Columbia University who did one in around 1907, 1910, and just surveyed all the, um, hospitals serving the Native American population and working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and they had, you know, again, virtually no cancer. And then what happens is these populations start eating Western diets, which are basically they add sugar and flour. And within 20, 30, 50 years, you've got cancer rates as high as you do in the Western populations and rates of obesity and diabetes and heart disease and hypertension and um, at the time, people weren't paying attention to Alzheimer's. But then you sort of fast forward to the present, and you could see the same observations being made. For instance, with Alzheimer's, there was a study that compared uh, African Americans living in, I think it was Illinois, to a population of Africans living in Nigeria. And they used the exact same criteria for diagnosis and the America, African Americans had much higher dementia and Alzheimer's rates. Um, you could see the rise in cancer and Inuits and Pima Indians over the second half of the 20th century going from virtually non-existent. You could see a rise in cancer with like, for instance, a classic case of Japanese women living in Japan had virtually no breast cancer. And then they move to the United States and within two generations, they have the same frequency of breast cancer as any other ethnic group. And back in the 19, early 1980s, some of the best epidemiologists in the world compared um, cancer rates between populations and in the same populations that had migrated from one area of the world to the other. And they concluded that some 30 to 70 percent of all cancers are caused by diet. That they're not cancers we have to get, they're not inherent to the human condition. Um, that they're literally caused by some factor of, you know, what we would call today the Western dying. The question is, what was that factor? And, um, you know, the first principle says your first thing you should be suspicious of is sugar and flour. It's like, for instance, the Japanese eat virtually no sugar in Japan. They come here, these, popula these isolated populations, which you add to the diet is sugar and flour. And then what I found was a line of research that began around the 1980s implicating insulin and this hormone insulin-like growth factor in cancer formation. And you could find the same uh, insulin being implicated in Alzheimer's plaque formation now. As a matter of fact, the simplest possible explanation for Alzheimer's disease is these amyloid beta plaques that, uh, these plaques that accumulate in the neurons in the brain are formed by this, from this protein amyloid beta, and that protein is broken down in the brain, is degraded by an enzyme that's called insulin degrading enzyme. And the reason it's called insulin degrading enzyme is because its primary function is to break down insulin after it's done its job. And 
been studies shown that if you infuse insulin into the cerebrospinal fluid of um, human subjects, their amyloid beta um, concentration will go up because the idea is that the amyloid beta and the insulin are competing for this enzyme and it preferentially degrades insulin. So if you raise insulin levels, you have less of it left to degrade this amyloid beta, which then clumps, the accumulates and clumps together into plaques. So the argument I was making in the book is there's a consistent story that goes back uh, 130 odd years and that can be found throughout the literature in different, you know, sort of horizontal, longitudinal and latitudinal studies uh, implicating sugar and flour and that it's something we should take very seriously.